Right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm really delighted today to welcome Kim Mesteller, uh, who is the Jean McCrae's Curator of South and Southeast Asian Art at the Nelson Atkins Museum. She came to Kansas City in 2008. Uh, before that, she was for several years Assistant Curator of Islamic and later Indian Art at the Harvard Art Museums. Um, since she's been at UMKC, uh, I'm sorry, whoops, since so she's been in Kansas City and at the Nelson Atkins, she's um, written a catalog for her area of the collection. It's titled Masterworks from India and Southeast Asia, uh, published 2016. Uh, she cur has curated several exhibitions. Uh, one that was part particularly evocative for our students was one called Echoes, Islamic Art and Contemporary Artists. Um, she's also, on top of all this, a uh, really terrific teacher and uh, sort of has hit the trifecta. She's taught at UMKC, I think two seminars, is that correct? Very, very, very well received students, really enthusiastic about the Islamic art uh, seminar. And she's also taught at the Art Institute and over at KU, that other school out in Lawrence. So, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, today she's going, well, she's going to give us a preview of an exhibition to come up and talk about Middle Eastern art and Midwestern collections. And so Kim, again, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, you are too kind. No, no, no. And uh, uh, yeah, you can ask me some other time to compare your students with that other school because <laughs> I left that experience kind of ticked off at some of those kids. So um, uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to share my screen and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, do a presentation. Uh, some research we did that around how museums were presenting um, uh, what we traditionally call Islamic art or art from the Middle East and um, Islamic cultures in South Asia uh, in Midwestern museum institutions, because a lot is being written about um, how museum galleries and exhibitions uh, are addressing uh, what, uh, historical Islamic art. Uh, and, um, but as often happens, uh, people don't always look at what's going on outside of New York uh, and the major kind of metropolitan um, centers in Europe and in Asia. And so um, I, I spent um, a little bit of time in research with some of my colleagues uh, to kind of uh, look at what's going on. So I'm going to try to share my screen. And then once it goes to PowerPoint mode, um, then I won't be able to see <laughs> you. So if you have questions or something, Forgive me, we can talk at the end. And um, and if something horrific goes on, I don't know how you get me some, maybe Jacob can yell yes. at me. And so. uh, if anything comes up during the uh, talk, I'll monitor chat and... Uh... Terrific, thanks. Okay, let's go here. And then let's go from the beginning. All right, do you have the title slide? Yep. Terrific. All right, that's half the battle. It's all of you who are doing Zoom meetings and teaching now. All right. Um, when we think about new museum installations of Islamic art, and by now I'm talking over the past 10 years, they're not exactly new, um, uh, but uh, we think about recent installations at major museums, which have gotten a lot of ten attention. The new galleries at the Louvre uh, and the V&A um, in the US, uh, there was a lot of interest and a lot of press and critical examination. The new galleries of art from the Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia, what used to be called the Islamic art galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and uh, what I was talking about and what gets missed is there are significant collections of art from the traditional Islamic lands, uh, lands in regional museums, uh, major museums across the Midwest and Central US. 
Midwestern cities are distinct in our histories, in our demographics and culture. And so today uh, I'd like to explore uh, some reinstallation and exhibition projects at three major Midwestern uh, museums. The St. Louis Art Museum, uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and our very own Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Um, you'll see that each institution has approached its Islamic art projects differently, uh, which resulted in different content and styles of presentation. And this is due to the a number of factors, the working methods of each museum, the reasons behind their installation and exhibition projects, uh, how and when or if they engage their communities uh, in their planning process. And I think that's a major factor, which I'll spend some time with because it gets about how um, different approaches to how museums address exhibitions in their publics today. Um, and I'd like to thank my colleagues, the Asian art curator at uh, St. Louis, Dr. Philip Hu, and uh, Swarupa Anila, the interpreter uh, at the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, for assisting me uh, with this research, which I'm going to share with you. We'll begin our Midwestern journey in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, at the St. Louis Museum of Art, uh, known by its acronym, acronym SLAM, St. Louis Art Museum. I bet it's a place that all of you have visited. Founded in 1879 uh, and inhabiting a building constructed for, for uh, the World's Fair, um, it is the oldest of the three museums that we'll visit today. Uh, this museum began collecting world art, including Islamic art in the 19th century. And in 2013, SLAM opened a new wing, the East Building, designed by the architect David Chipperfield. In association with this construction, most of the galleries at SLAM were refreshed, reinstalled, or flat out relocated, including the display of Islamic art, which moved from a small hidden corner, uh, in kind of in the back of the first floor um, at the entrance to the Asian wing, uh, to two prominent locations in the institution today. Uh, the first uh, um, Islamic art that the visitor encounters is in the lobby itself, this kind of great hall. Um, the large alcoves to either side of the lobby were installed with grand works of art that make a big impression. And indeed the only objects with aesthetic roots that lie beyond the Western tradition uh, in this important location. And these are all terms we can talk about later, Western, Eastern, um, uh, Islamic, and so forth. Um, uh, these are in fact, Western works of art are these colossal uh, wooden doors from Toledo, Spain. Uh, these are shown with related examples of what we call mudahar art, Islamic inspired art often early on made by Muslims, uh, but after the reconquest of Spain. Uh, this installation privileges Islamic art and its cultural heritage by placing it in a highly visible space in one of the most heavily trafficked areas of the museum. And location is important, uh, both where something is in space and then how you interact with it with other uh, um, other objects um, in a space. And that's something kind of that we'll kind of talk about this morning with a few of the different projects. Um, SLAM installed its uh, new dedicated gallery of Islamic art in a different location in the basement. And that might worry you until you see this basement. Again, if you've been there, you've seen this, but just like what Chipperfield did for the Neuss Museum in Berlin, uh, they did in St. Louis, and he carved this amazing uh, kind of almost like tomb-like staircase, this grand stairway that cuts into the lower level, right in the middle of the lobby is a major feature. And um, it creates this uh, view, and what they put in the uh, direct line of your gaze is one of their masterpieces from their Islamic collections, this large mom look. Uh, metal basin, uh, which is comparable, if some of you know the Great Basin in the Louvre, um, uh, this, this is 
a similarly grand and beautifully inlaid uh, work. Um, this was a very interesting uh, issue, according to the curator. Um, uh, the basement of this space um, was heavily sought after by every curator in the museum for their collections. So it was a they they fought for this space because of its vi visibility from the lobby and because the gallery sits in front of the door of the museum cafe, and therefore even <laughs> in the basement, it's one of the most heavily trafficked rooms in the museum. Uh, the design of the galleries. Uh, which I think you can see here, uh, is clean and fresh looking. Again, it's so bright you wouldn't know your uh, sub-level. Um, they used a light bright color palette and new very crisp uh, uh, and I can tell you expensive casework. Uh, the cases mix media, adding visual interest, uh, like you see here where they put metalwork, lacquer, um, uh, ceramics, uh, wood uh, together uh, in dialogue. And the interpretive materials consist of traditional text-based labels, a wall text panels, and a map. The approach to the content here at St. Louis is scholarly. It's evident in this map, which helps trace the development of Islamic art and culture through trade along both the Silk Road and the fur routes that run to the north. Uh, the installation was organized and managed by the Islamic or by the Asian Curatorial Department at St. Louis. And their institutional method at SLAM is a bit old school, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, they develop their exhibitions internally, uh, driven by the curators, uh, and the resulting exhibitions are beautiful. Uh, when asked if they'd involve the public uh, in this project, and specifically members of local Muslim communities in St. Louis and their planning. Philip said no, but he said that public engagement and programming are the next step in their efforts. The second institution we're visiting is the Detroit Institute of Arts, known as the DIA. Founded in 1883, the DIA benefited from many things. Uh, the robust economy of the Motor City, uh, which, as you all know, for most of the 20th century was the headquarters and center of manufacturing for the major uh, American automotive companies. Um, you can see that in Detroit's heyday, uh, when the museum was built, this is 1927, uh, uh, it's in this beautiful gleaming marble Renaissance palace. It's a stunning, white. Uh, confection dropped uh, here uh, into the city block and it's surrounded by these wonderful parked cars. It's a car city uh, from the beginning. Um, and the DIA originally benefited from these relationships with the car companies. They had great support by industrials like the Ford family. Um, they had a very healthy at the time arrangement with the city of Detroit. It's a civic uh, museum. And they had a large and prosperous population. In fact, in 1950, Detroit boasted the highest per capita income for any city in the United States. Of course, times have changed and the DIA's support and audiences has also changed. And that led to a sea change in museological approaches ushered in by the hiring of Graham Beale as their director in the year 2000. Beale helped transform the institution to create a more audience-focused and audience-friendly museum. This was achieved through a heavy investment in museum education, particularly in a new area, a new field called museum interpretation. Detroit is now considered a leading innovator in interpretation among US museums. And you see some of their handiwork in their permanent galleries, especially. Uh, like here, uh, we're in their European galleries, which walk you through um, a day and night in a uh, European household or palace. Uh, one of the highlights is this animated dining table in the dining room section that you can sit down and, and have set for you. Um, other areas uh, where that are interactive include displays like this, where uh, there are these interactive audience response stations. Uh, set up in the African art galleries, inviting you to 
think about ideas or issues raised in the spaces and write your own personal response to share. Their new Islamic gallery opened in 2010, replacing a smaller, much older installation. At Detroit, exhibitions and galleries are developed in teams consisting of a curator and an interpreter from the beginning. Uh, they work together from day one, and then they bring on other staff as needed at different stages of the project. The curator behind this gallery project was Heather Ecker, who's now actually at Dallas Museum of Art, I believe, Dallas Art Museum. Um, Detroit's gallery is arranged thematically, and although certain themes give weight to art associated with a particular region or works cr created in a particular media, um, uh, the, it still holds together as kind of thematic experience. Uh, the teams developed their, what we call uh, in museum education, big ideas identifying key characteristics and concepts that they wanted to emphasize to their audiences, uh, which helped to define uh, the sections uh, within the gallery. The resulting installation, which was planned and installed over a period of about 20 months, is dramatic and beautiful. The team chose a dark, rich color palette for the walls and uh, it allowed them to dramatically light objects, which gives a kind of intimate and subdued environment and gives a kind of a, a feeling of reverence for the works of art. The designers used traditional pointed arch forms, uh, like you see here on the left for some of the galleries and casework um, to evoke the architecture of the Middle East and, South and Islamic South Asia. Um, this is most evident here in the creation of a separate room devoted to calligraphy and sacred writing. And uh, this room is actually entered by this, uh, through this arched entrance way to either side. Inside this room, we find bookcases set up with texts, including examples of the Quran and also sacred texts, uh, texts from other religions. We also find additional interpretive materials, including contextual photographs and a film of the contemporary American calligrapher Mohammed Zakaria at work. Swarupa called out the commission and inclusion of the film in the display as one of the features that she was most proud of. Other interpretive materials in the galleries include text panels, uh, detail exploration panels, prompts like you see on the right, layered labels and an interactive carpet pattern activity. And uh, very much interested in, in finding um, strategies that engage people of all ages, that families can do together, that children can do, and then, and then a, um, content that maybe is more appealing to adults or more experienced audiences. Today, the greater Detroit region has the largest Muslim population in the United States. In 2007, the DIA did not work with the community when they started their gallery project on the front end of planning those permanent galleries. However, that step is part of their standard working process now. But the DIA did engage the local community in planning a mid-career respective of the artist Shirin Nishat in 2013. One might have thought that an exhibition of Shirin Nishat, one of the best known contemporary artists from the Middle East, would have been of great interest to the Muslim communities in Detroit. However, early discussions revealed that local community members who were mostly Arab in their heritage did not feel a strong connection with Nishat or her work um, for she's uh, Iranian born American with deep and her content was deeply rooted in Iranian culture and history. Conversations with the community helped the museum uncover these issues um, that and realize that they needed to address them um, to make the show more relevant to multiple audiences, including local Muslims. Focus groups also helped Detroit design the exhibition. 
and their original layout of the show, they envisioned a chronological uh, display of Nishat's career, which would have meant installing photographs from her Woman of Allah series, which you see depicted here uh, in this slide. Um, this was her uh, earliest important body of work, perhaps her most famous body of work, of, um, and this would have been in the first gallery of the exhibition. Through community conversations and consultants, the staff learned that the community was most concerned with this series uh, because of its juxtapositions of humans, calligraphy, and in several examples of the photographs, firearms. They feared that these works would cause visitors to associate Islam with violence. Uh, this prompted the DIA to reorganize the exhibition to introduce Shirin Nishat and her career through a series of film and video projects first in the show and with ample explanatory text. So when visitors were well informed about the artist and her response to Iranian history, uh, that was at that point, they would enter the gallery with the Woman of Allah series near the end of the show. The final project that I'll uh, talk about was a project uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Conley mentioned uh, right here in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins. We're the youngest of these three institutions opening our doors in 1933. However, with our new director, Julian Zagoitia, the Nelson Atkins has changed its focus over the last 10 years towards a visitor and community engagement model which is evident in our most recent strategic plan and in our mission statement, where the power of art meets the spirit of community. Public response to the changing institution has been positive. Um, and actually, I, I still don't understand this, but in 2017, the Nelson Atkins was actually voted the number one art museum in the United States on Yelp. Yay. <laughs> Let's keep it up. Um, the Nelson Atkins has a global collection, including its famous holdings of Chinese art. I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, the Chinese art galleries. But what you may not know is that we also have a small but nice collection of what's historically called Islamic art, enough to fill a Persian period room, uh, which was here when we opened in 1933. However, uh, those collections have been off view pretty much since the mid 1990s for a lack of space. So when I joined the museum in 2008, one of our very first projects was to survey the Islamic collection um, because uh, uh, my collections include the artwork from South, Southeast Asia and West Asia, Islamic West Asia. Um, and also to set up a series of conservation treatments, a conservation schedule um, with the intention of developing an exhibition and someday hopefully new galleries. Um, during the next few years, we were offered opportunities to showcase contemporary art from the Middle East and South Asia, uh, both through loans of work from local art collectors and through hosting a new project by a young local artist of Pakistani-American uh, artist, Ashir Akram. We thought that we should take advantage of the serendipity of all these opportunities. So we developed a proposal for an exhibition that created a conversation between traditional works of art from the Islamic lands and contemporary works of what I called uh, Islamic inspired art. Here you see an outline version of the exhibition proposal from 2012 that we presented internally as part of our approval process. Um, you'll note that the top three big ideas in the proposal address community engagement and participation, not just the artwork that's going to be shown. And I would say that's a change from how our museum and many museums uh, used to work. This would be an opportunity to reintroduce the Kansas City public to Islamic art as it had been off view for decades. It's also a very different Kansas City now than it was then um, with a much larger and more diverse population. And so this little exhibition uh, really quickly evolved into a big project because it had a lot of work to do. 
Our core team consisted of myself, that's the curator, Rose May, who was our interpreter at the time, and Amanda Ramirez, who was our designer at the time, who's now at the Getty. Um, we invested our efforts heavily in front in public discussions, surveys, focus groups, and consultations with community members and field specialists to help us shape the exhibition. Uh, you'll see some of the feedback we gathered in this front-end research in the next couple slides. So here, these comments come from audience, mem audience members after I gave a public presentation on the Islamic art collection and our initial exhibition ideas. We asked for audience feedback. Uh, you'll see we got some astute observations and advice. Um, my favorite comment was, you can't outmet the Met. Well, that's certainly true, but in 2017, we out yelped them. So, um, but uh, that's absolutely true. So what do you do with a smaller collection and less space? How do you tell a story? You can't tell the same story. The Met can tell. Um, when it came time to develop the title of the exhibition, and some of you may have been involved in both of these processes, actually, uh, we did title testing through surveys to three groups of constituents. General museum visitors, which we snagged here on site, students and faculty from local colleges, including UMKC, and local Muslims. And I must thank my intern at the time, Hamama Bushra, who some of you may know. She was working on her MA thesis in art history at UMKC at the time. And she took surveys uh, both to her mosque and she helped us organize some community uh, focus groups uh, for this exhibition planning. The first set of title options, Making the Past Present and Reorient, uh, you see on the uh, top left, drew strong and polarizing responses from our three focus groups. Uh, and I'll just tell you that um, uh, the uh, reorient, which we thought was kind of a nice reappropriation here, um, that was one that the academic audiences and students thought was orientalizing and shot down. And our local Muslim community members loved it because they saw it as reappropriating the term. But it was so extreme, absolutely yes, absolutely no, that had to go. Making the past, past present, academic audiences liked, and our local Muslim focus group members hated because they felt it made it seem like they were trapped in the past. And so that was a really interesting conversation. So given that our favorite titles were completely either loved or hated, we threw all that out and we started over uh, and we came up with the title Echoes. Uh, which was the favorite of all the groups surveyed in a second round of testing. So this took like six or eight months to nail a title down for the show. Um, if you wonder how these things get done. Um, uh, it, interestingly though, not one member of any of these groups raised an issue, at least to us in these conversations with the term Islamic art. And that is where I thought we would have our biggest challenge uh, for obvious reasons. And you know, we're happy to discuss it, but it, it's, a, it's a, a term which is challenging to define. And so it's used and very purposely not used in the field, depending on who, uh, who you're talking with because of the challenges of that term. Um, later in our process, we created three focus groups that just engaged different Muslim communities across the city. Uh, these groups consisted of members of the, your local Muslim Student Association uh, at UMKC, residents from an affluent suburb uh, south of the city, and members of a prominent African-American mosque uh, right here on Troost uh, Avenue. Um, we received a great deal of feedback from these 
groups. This is as we're closer to kind of finalizing the exhibition at this point and laying it out in, in space, making our, our final choices. And um, we received great feedback, including thoughts about works of art on the checklist, concerns about how Middle Eastern art is represented and actually more concerned that it dominated the content of the exhibition. Um, uh, how to present this to an American Muslim audience and um, concerns also about like how sacred texts would be shown. And all of this input uh, helped us think about our design and presentation of uh, this show. So I'll quickly walk you through uh, a few of the um, installation images. Um, this was our main uh, kind of graphic program uh, on the left uh, that tried to bring together, we picked two uh, works, historical and contemporary, that spoke to each other um, and tried to get a fresh design that, but that also echoed aspects of Islamic art and culture. We used a color palette, um, which you'll see here and you'll see in the galleries as well. Um, uh, bringing historical colors into the uh, white cube space. Uh, our main gallery was the project space, our L8 gallery, which is um, uh, reserved for kind of, used to be reserved for contemporary art uh, projects. And then we overflowed into the contemporary galleries and some other spaces around the museum. Uh, this is a view from inside the gallery and you can see it is a white cube. It's in the contemporary galleries, um, but we used accent colors drawn from the artworks, ochre, um, turquoise blue, uh, that comes from the, the beautiful glazed tile work and ceramics, um, and then a dark, um, very dark kind of uh, indigo cobalt uh, color as well. Um, we used a title wall text to propose the content of the exhibition, um, and uh, the title wall had the job to define for us what the terms were. Um, we defined how we were going to use the terms Islamic art and contemporary artists. Um, we wanted on the title uh, wall as well, um, we had a lot of debate about um, uh, should we put a map, for example, uh, somewhere? Uh, because we have like a lot of ceramics from Kashan in what is now Iran. Do people know where that is? How do they, you know, how will they understand the reach of the show? And I was adamant in such a small gallery that I wasn't going to give up two or three works of art so they could throw a map in there. We had to find another place to put it. So it became the title wall. And we used it as a framing device uh, to uh, conceptually as well, because the idea is that the show would bring together historic and contemporary art. So we wanted it to, to mark every site in the world where historic arts were created or came from, and also every site where the contemporary artists we were representing were living and working. So the map uh, includes sites in South Asia, the Middle East, um, Europe, America, including Kansas City. Um, we incorporated uh, multiple voices throughout um, the exhibition to try to let, when possible, artists talk for themselves. So we had listening stations on iPads uh, with interviews from a number of the artists, uh, as well as um, uh, on the website uh, for the show. And um, we also wanted to address the diversity of perspectives. The Islamic uh, art and Islam itself isn't a monolith. Um, and so uh, we engaged the Harvard Islamic scholar Ali Asani um, to write a panel uh, for us. Uh, his panel that he created, he named Many Islams and Diverse Art. Um, and then the artworks in the show uh, which you can see the gallery, we used that wonderful arch to frame uh, the um, entrance into the space, kind of where uh, everything, all these conversations came together. Um, and then the artworks were grouped together uh, where they shared aesthetic concerns, 
or similar materials or similar content. Um, and uh, uh, so we see this here in this juxtaposition between a Hummer Abbas um, geometric uh, paper plate against a beautiful Kashan bowl. Um, and they're both interested in geometry, but they're both doing something very different. Um, and uh, this wonderful medallion carpet, which I'll just tell you, you'll get to see again next this fall um, uh, with um, a work, um, a contemporary uh, work, a photo mosaic uh, that creates a carpet, um, but dissolves into a, a much uh, kind of more poignant subject matter as you approach it. Um, the uh, other part of the, this exhibition, again, partly because we didn't have room uh, to include everything we wanted to, and we wanted to invite the um, artist Ahmed Mater to participate in the show. So we, um, uh, in our Asian rotation space, Gallery 203, we installed a focused suite um, around his illuminations work, these two uh, kind of large uh, um, works on paper collages uh, that use x-rays um, as their kind of uh, central illuminated image. So it's kind of a play on light um, as well as other content. Um, and we put that in a room with other illuminated manuscript pages from the collection. And then Ahmed Mater's work uh, contribution was, uh, we were a venue for his amazing Pakistani cargo truck, a uh, contemporary creation that um, he made here in Kansas City and then parked here off and on during the exhibition. And this is an exhibition that hits the road and uh, travels and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful project that brings um, uh, kind of Midwestern and American and Native American imagery and traditional Islamic uh, design uh, onto the form of a, a Pakistani cargo truck. Uh, public engagement continued uh, through the series of programs, including a historical symposium and a family celebration, which you see here. Um, for the celebration, we had art making activities. Uh, we had a luminary night parade uh, where large illuminated puppets were made by local school children. And uh, we had a stargazing um, activity with, uh, in partnership with the Kansas City Astronomy Association. Um, in summary, I'd say that each of these museum projects Turned, turned out to be quite different in its appearance and also in its content. Uh, that's due uh, in partly uh, to how the institutionals, institutions work and their individual house styles for how something should look. Um, but each of these projects also had very different goals. And um, I would say that they should look different because they represent, uh, they come from different institutions, different minds and aesthetic sensibilities, and they also represent different communities. Um, after this experience, I would encourage any museum or anybody taking on a large cultural project like this to work with their local community members, uh, both in the front end to help plan uh, project, but also in post installation evaluation. If whenever possible, whenever you have the staff, or the time or the money uh, to do so. Um, engaging in the in community uh, mem uh, in these projects, I think encourages kind of personal ownership uh, and advocacy uh, for the projects. Um, it also maybe helps that ownership maybe helps bring a sense of pride and connection with one's local institution, uh, which may not have been there previously because they didn't, people don't feel uh, that they're being um, engaged or considered um, in a traditional museum model. Um, and I think it's important 
though, to define how you're going to use outside feedback and outside ideas um, and value that feedback. Um, knowing that you can't act on every single idea or concern, but you can certainly hear them. Um, I believe that asking for those ideas is a critical step in making um, and keeping museums relevant in our communities um, into the 21st century. Um, and so I look very much forward to seeing what these three institutions, including our own, become. Um, so as an epilogue, as a final note, I want to give you a teaser. Um, uh, as you know, uh, just as UMKC and everyone around us closed uh, last spring, the Nelson Atkins closed we, uh, down in March. We didn't reopen until uh, September. And uh, like other museums around the world, our schedules, our work, our, our ability to do what we normally do was thrown into flux. And we had to cancel uh, or postpone about two years of programs and exhibitions. And some of those may come back, some of those may not. Um, but in the meantime, we have this hole to fill in our activity at a time when we most want to be a place for people to engage and come to uh, and start to feel safe and involved again in the city. And so um, rather than leave the featured exhibition galleries empty, we were given the charge this winter to develop um, a series of exhibitions and programs based upon the collections. And so in record time, I can't tell you how terrified I am that we're going to meet these deadlines. Uh, we are turning out four, five exhibitions that will start opening. When does it beginning of June, July, August, September, October. Um, and um, you're probably some of the first people to hear about it because the press release goes out like this week on this. Uh, and um, but they're really exciting projects. Uh, one community based um, uh, contemporary artists, um, but then a range of projects uh, uh, that will fill these ga exhibition galleries. And so two of them I'm flagging for you, uh, because they uh, will address um, the Islamic and South Asian uh, collections. Uh, and Asian art collections in general are Origins, Collecting to Create the Nelson Atkins, which opens in August, and um, will explore how, between, how in 10 years we created one of the best regional museums in the United States with some of the best Asian collections outside of Asia. Um, and that's a really fun kind of history of the museum behind the scenes story. Uh, and the arch will be featured. I just spent last week going through files in the registrar's office with the telegrams back and forth about this disastrous shipping of this object. And um, so we're going to share a lot of that uh, with you to kind of go behind the scenes on, on how this place came to be in the middle of the depression. Um, when everybody else was tightening their belts or shutting down. Um, and then in September, uh, we're opening an exhibition that by all rights should be a major traveling exhibition with catalog. Um, Weaving Splendor, Treasures of Asian Textiles, uh, where we will feature some uh, uh, absolute masterworks, really historically important um, uh, objects. Um, but every work in this show is a star of um, works from China, Japan, India, and Iran. And um, we'll, we have uh, works in themselves that are kind of the best of their type, like the 100 crane rope, which will be a featured object with a biography. Um, uh, from the Ming Dynasty Prince uh, Gal's tomb. Uh, so you'll get to meet him and uh, this robe in that exhibition. 
Uh, we have a, a fantastic section uh, in this show devoted to Japanese theater costumes uh, we, and um, Chinese theater. We have a wonderful section coming up on interiors uh, and the way textiles are used to create and shape and, and um, uh, enliven space. Um, in that, we have fragments from a very famous uh, Persian tent. Amazing that we have these fragments. And so we're going to talk about what that tent is and what it means. And it's one of these original um, great pieces that you can trace from the Safavid court to the Ottoman court, to the Ottoman siege of to Vienna, to the siege of Vienna, and then to, with the royal family coming out of Vienna back to Poland. Um, it's just an amazing story. And so we'll, we'll have, a, we have a wonderful section that, bring, that will end the exhibition on uh, global exchange of Asian textiles that will cover everything from diplomatic gifts to trade objects that bring us right to Kansas City. So um, I can't wait to share all of that with you and I hope we make it. <laughs> by September 25th. But anyway, that's what I've got to share for you. And uh, this show, uh, both, all of the shows will be up at least until early March, probably March 6th uh, at the, you know, uh, so there's a chance for tours, there's a chance for talks, there's a chance for teaching uh, for anyone who's interested. So that's what I've got. Thank you. Okay, Thank if you, you so can take the share off and maybe we can engage with some direct questions. If people want to ask questions of Kim, please unmute yourself. And uh, because there were none in the chat. Well, let me okay. Just, oh, go ahead. Bibi. This is not a question. This is a comment. This was absolutely fabulous, outstanding, interesting things that I didn't know very much about and now got explained. And I'm going to come to these exhibits. So thank you very much, Kim. This was special, very special. Yeah. Uh, including your inside information. Uh, I really enjoyed them. Well, thank you very much. I, I do hope you come. Let us know when you're coming. Okay. Oh, I have a question. Um, you commented on uh, having a very high, highly select but small Islamic collection or whatever the term is. Um, are you actively trying to grow that collection? And if so, do you have donors that are interested in helping grow that collection? Uh, uh, yes, and, and yes, I think uh, to both, I hope to both parts of that. Um, the, the challenge is, uh, you know, one, you know, once we launch someday a new suite of galleries, wherever that would be, um, you know, then one could even fold the fundraising for works of art into that. Right. This is me scheming. Um, the The challenge is, you know, the market. Obviously, um, Islamic art really, with the with the development of these outstanding collections outside of. Europe and America in the 2000s and through the 2000 teens, uh, the market really exploded in terms of value. And so it's a hard area to collect. And, you know, the, the Nelson has an interesting part of our challenge is what our role is, right? We're not a teaching institution. So we don't collect everything. We don't, we, tr we have, the, we try not to collect a large amount that we have to store of works that may not be a quality that we might not show all the time because of that quality issue. So we're kind of in this odd 
collecting space. And so we're encouraged to go for the best examples of their type. Well, the last time we did that, <laughs> we bid at Sotheby's on um, uh, just a couple of years ago on an amazing um, Isnik. We don't have a single piece of Isnik ware. Isnik tile, I mean, it's shocking mm -hmm. to, to me. This is one of those, even if we're not an encyclopedic everything, we need that. And so, um, you know, in, that's all that's been on the list since I got here. And so the greatest piece that's probably come up for sale in 50 years is, uh, it was a great big blue and white Islamic charger from the first phase of uh, Imperial Iznik ceramics um, under Mehmed II. The, it, was, the, it was to die for. There were only four known in the world that have survived and this fifth one shows up. And we, it was in London and we had um, our consultant who now lives in London was the former director of the Freer Sackler and he's friends with Julian and, and he went to bid for us. And um, the estimate was 500,000 pounds. And so the idea is, do you buy a bunch of stuff or do you buy a couple things, but they're the best in the world with your funds, right? Now, this is all before this most recent pandemic and how that's affected our, our funds and the economy and everybody else, right? This is several years ago. And Julian made a good, but I think a safe museum amount. I don't even remember what, and I couldn't tell you if I did remember it of what we could do. I don't know who he was going to ask for help with this, <laughs> but, um, but it went in the end um, for with the buyer's premium, which is the share that Sotheby's gets. If you convert it from pounds to dollars, it went for six and a half million dollars. Wow. Uh. We would have had the best piece in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> but we couldn't do that, right? And and you probably and we shouldn't do that, honestly. You know, if, uh, even even though I still dream about the what ifs around that piece, because <laughs> you don't have to know Islamic art to put this in a room with a spotlight on it and walk away. It it told it. It's like a Monet. It sung its old, own song. Um, it was that good of a thing, but. But I feel like, so we need to find, to build this collection in this market, we need to find strategies to get the best pieces we can, but realize we can't get that masterpiece uh, as all of them because we, the market is so different now. If we're things that have a safe provenance that are where they should be in the world, came there the way they should get there yeah. um, and are of high quality. There's just not much left that's historic. And so the other thing to look at is um, modern and contemporary art to help fill out the story. It also helps us um, prove to the world that these, uh, um, uh, you know, that Turkey still makes art, that there are artists still there, that there are artists still, you know, uh, active. And so that's one way we can flesh out uh, the collections. Okay. Well, I, I do have one. Is it too late? Uh, as far as contemporary, would the Nelson uh, commission any works for some of these exhibitions coming up or do you anticipate that? I think that's a great idea. And I uh, you know the Met did this with their galleries, right? They, they were weak on Spanish and Moroccan mm. works. And um, and they very wisely commissioned yes, a courtyard. Right. And I think that's a um, Good. by contemporary artist, I'm at the moment but in, in the that style. And I think that's a strategy uh, we could employ. Two presentation mm -hmm. recording. Yeah. That's. Uh. Bye.
have some other questions, but I'll ask you another time since it's almost two. And but thank you so much. That was great to hear, and I'm really excited for the fall. Yeah, yeah, we can't wait to oh, see, it looks see you like all. It'll be, yeah, and will the textiles travel? Do you think? Not now, but it. I mean, that's part of our problem is you can't really even travel things now. Yeah. Um, you know, when they had to deinstall the um, the Nefertari show, that's a loan from um, Turin, Italy, Torino, and they um, the their curators and conservators couldn't come, and that's so it sat mm -hmm. here for six months in the gallery mm -hmm. while they were hoping to come. And they couldn't. So in the end, they did they did the deinstallation with multiple cameras on Zoom with Italy, <laughs> at, starting at six a.m. in the morning. Wow. Here for like two or three weeks, every single thing, so they could do the job they're supposed to do normally. And it was wow. it, it's just really hard right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the textile show that's like the works are light sensitive, so they're down for five years. If we were to travel every every six months, something like this is on view, it's down for at least three years, often five years. So oh. if we travel that show a few years down the road, which we could, I think, um, then we those textiles can't be shown here then for another X number of years. That said, most of them haven't been on view for decades. Some of them never. <laughs> so oh. I think it's OK to think about traveling yeah. it. Right. Okay, thank you, Kim. Thank you. I very, very much uh -huh. appreciate Thanks. your. Oh, you're welcome. It was great to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. You all have a nice uh, sunny day. <laughs> yes. And uh, see you at the next program.